Is it time to panic yet for the Denver Broncos? Well, Teddy Bridgewater says not yet, but it is soon. What does that mean? How do you interpret that? Plus, it is crossover Thursday. We have locked on Washington football team host David Harrison. He joins us to preview Sunday's matchup for the Denver Broncos and Washington. We break down all that action and much more on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back into a brand new episode of Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Locked On NFL Network, your team every day from the South Stands to the end zone. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke, joined alongside by my co-host, Sarah Bettinger. Both of us, we cover the Denver Broncos for the Locked On Network and Nine News. Make sure you follow and subscribe, free and available everywhere you get your podcasts. And thank you for making Locked On Broncos your first listen of the day. If you'd like to watch us as well here on YouTube, just hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss out on a Day's worth of Denver Broncos news, content, and coverage. And Sarah, my friend, today's episode of show is brought to you by our good friends over there, McDonald's. I'll tell you about them a little bit later. But, you know, as always, Sarah, I'm loving it. We need to talk Broncos football here once again with the avid listeners all across Broncos country. Yeah, absolutely. Cody, I know today we're recording on Wednesday. So, I mean, was it a McRourke, you know, kind of day, the McRourke <laughs> sandwich? I, I don't know. I mean, it feels like it should have been. Over here, it's rainy. It seems like the perfect day to just – nestle in with a couple of mcrourke sandwiches and then just get mm. after that day off absolutely and for those of you wondering what the heck a mcrourke is it's a you know sausage egg <laughs> mcmuffin with a hash brown inside of it so you know you thank me later for our, our good friend c keith he's a listener here of the show he sent me in that he had listened to lockdown broncos this morning and he also had a mcrourke so i love it we're making it a thing in broncos country thank you for always uh, tuning in here to the show but sarah uh, i wanted to open up today's show before we get into our crossover david harrison host of lockdown washington football team just uh Interesting comments by Vic Fangio in the media. I know this is something that you were talking about. You put a couple of tweets out there. And Teddy Bridgewater, just some interesting comments by both of them. First off, I want to give an injury update. Vic Fangio did say that Von Miller, if it were to be determined today, a potential game status, it would be questionable. Obviously, on Wednesday, he did not participate. Same with Mike Purcell. We know Purcell will likely be out this weekend. But he said something else, too, because there was a question that was brought up about Teddy Bridgewater. And he did an interview early on this week with KOA. And he said he was about 70, 75% heading in to this game. And Vic's comments were a little interesting. Do you care to enlighten Broncos country on your thoughts on the subject matter? I mean, it's it's one of the most frustrating things. And I think right now tension is extremely high, right? So, I mean, we kind of got to check our emotions at the door with with all, all these different things. You know, Vic Fangio meets the press. It'd be easy just to look for reasons, you know, to get get after him about something that he said. But unfortunately, he's kind of making it easy for us to get after him with with this this comment that Teddy Bridgewater made about being 70 to 75 percent healthy only validated the things that we had previously talked about, Cody. The fact that Bridgewater was kind of limping around the team facility in the video footage that we had all seen made public on Twitter last week. The fact that he was kind of limping around the field against the Browns during the game Uh, and the fact that you have a 100 percent healthy backup quarterback who the coach said before the season even began, you feel like you can win with both guys. You and I have brought that up almost daily on this podcast to just reiterate the fact that Vic Fangio seems to be kind of, yeah, exactly. It's one of those super (laughs) frustrating things. Makes you want to rip out your hair and just scream at the sky and just wonder why, why is he doing this? So Fangio's response to the reason why he played Teddy Bridgewater at 70 to 75%, First of all, he came back and said, well, I think he was a little bit higher than that, which, I mean, who really cares what you thought? The player himself said he was 70 to 75%. And second of all, his comment about the fact that, that you know, Teddy never told me he couldn't play. Uh, that is a huge red flag to me. You, you mentioned that on yesterday's episode, Cody, kind of this whole red flag deal that's going on right now. Huge red flag for Vic Fangio to come out and say, well, Teddy never told me he couldn't play, so I'm going to take him at his – that's just that's just trash, yeah. man. For you know, keeping it PG on this show, you know that's that's bull. And, and I just I, I'm fed up with the way that that Fangio is kind of treating the the day to day, the week to week, especially at the quarterback position where Teddy struggled. 
Yeah, well, and even Teddy Bridgewater said something interesting as well. He said, you know, he told Drew Locke after, the, I believe it was the Raiders game, that, you know, hey, prepare this week as if it's going to be you. Uh, and then apparently his adrenaline kicked in and he was able to go. But I, I think there's a miscommunication issue throughout the Broncos right now, whether it be from players to coaches, coaches to players, so on and so forth. It, it doesn't look any better when you get these responses from one person and then you get a completely different response from somebody else like Teddy Bridgewater who's like, yeah, I was 70, 75%. And then obviously today he said, you know, I, you know, I can't – I." Wouldn't put a number on it, but it's already out there. The audio bite is out yeah. there. People have heard it. And then obviously when things don't align, it, it, it creates this question. And, and this is where I think a lot of the scrutiny from the fan base towards the coaching staff, towards the organization has really come from. And, and look, it's frustrating because he said, you and I have been covering the Broncos for quite some time. And, and it's easy to see where things used to be, right? Things were, mm -hmm. it was a tight ship. It was efficient. There was no question. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden now it just seems like there's leakage every other uh, every other way there but even that too what he had said about jerry judy and this will be a quick one here is uh, he was asked a question about you know what is the addition of having jerry judy back in the offense how does that change maybe the way that defenses try to play you guys and his response was well it's not going to change much and i understand maybe that right maybe the defense maybe because the broncos have just simply struggled maybe they won't change their approach but i think the optics of what he had said when you feature in a guy like jerry judy who had six catches 72 yards was getting open consistently against against the New York Giants is that ah, it's not going to make much of a difference. If you're a player, you hear that and you're just like, wait right. a minute. Okay. So I'm not a difference maker. I mean, it could be misread either way. I mean, it could be Jerry Judy could have heard that and be like, Whoops, I'll show him. Or it could be like, okay, do they not feel like I could be a difference maker? I mm -hmm. think it creates a little bit of a rift in the locker room. It does. And it's, you know, Vic Fangio has no problem going out and talking about how Darren Waller is a wide receiver and a tight ends body, got the speed, got the size, got the hands, but then, you know, he gets an opportunity to talk about his own guy, his own star receiver, a uh, budding star receiver in this league who's coming back from injury, who is expected to make a massive impact in this game, you get an opportunity to talk him up and you get an opportunity to kind of put some bulletin board material out there and you don't take it. Uh, that to me is a huge problem. You know, Jerry Judy is a, is a budding star player who does drastically change the way a defense has to play your offense. He's got speed. He's a great route runner. He's always open. He's always creating separation. He's outstanding after the catch. Who has, who has had that skill set in the Broncos offense for the last five or six weeks uh, outside of Jerry Judy in week one, you know? And so I, I just think Fangio is failing in, in a number of ways right now. And that comment to me is, is just atrocious. No, it goes back to what we had said last week about the rumblings we've heard about the staff and, and Vic really losing the locker room. The message that he is speaking is people aren't really taking it serious anymore inside the locker room from what we've been told. So we'll see how things kind of go here for the Denver Broncos. Obviously a tough matchup against the Washington football team is not going to be easy for a number of circumstances despite their record. I mean, we can obviously say that sitting here from the Broncos side of things, but Broncos country coming up here in just a moment. We're going to get into a conversation with David Harrison, host of the Locked On Washington football team. Good friend of mine, good friend of the show. And as we preview Sunday's action, you're going to hear the Washington football side of things. You're going to hear the Broncos side of things. We're going to get to that coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that, let me tell you about McDonald's. And this episode of Lockdown Broncos is brought to you by our good friends over there. McDonald's proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends and family, they can come to reconnect. And it's a place where classmates can meet up after school. Or if you go to a tailgate, you go to a game, you can go up and you can have breakfast with your friends, family, or even rivals of opposing teams at McDonald's. McDonald's today. It's a place you always look forward to stopping to as well on a long road trip to rest your legs. And like I mentioned, go to McDonald's. If you get a chance to anytime, it, could, it don't have to be Wednesday like my routine, but if you go to McDonald's, get that breakfast sandwich that you want, get a McRourke. Like I said, get that hash brown, put it on your sausage egg McMuffin, send us a picture of Lockdown Broncos, tag Sarah and myself, hashtag McRourke, and obviously we'll shout you out here at the YouTube contest giveaway, but check it out today. McDonald's, make sure you check it out. Bada, ba 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 Sarah. I'm loving it. But you know something I'm else I'm it. loving too, Sarah, and that's our good friends over there, rockauto.com. And the reason I love rockauto.com is because they've been serving auto parts customers online for over 20 years, 20 years of reliable service. And if you need anything for your vehicle, rockauto.com is the go-to that you should utilize every single time you need something for your vehicle. Whether you have something that's missing, whether you want to add something to your vehicle, or whether you're renovating a project in the garage, they have everything you could be looking for because their catalog is unique. It's remarkably easy to navigate, and you can quickly see 
all the parts available for your car or truck based on year, make, model, brands, specifications, and even the prices that you prefer. And prices at rockauto.com, Sarah, they're always reliably low, whether you're a professional or do it yourself. Or go to rockauto.com right now and tell them that Lockdown Broncos sent you in their How Did You Hear About Us box and check it out today. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Rockauto.com. It is Crossover Thursday all across the Locked On Podcast Network, and we have a big time game on Sunday. The Denver Broncos hosting the Washington football team. And to help us preview this game, we're joined by our good friend David Harrison, host of the Locked On Washington football team. And David, great as always to see. You. I get to see you a couple times. Obviously, he's one of the hosts too of the Locked On Bucks podcast. Not to mention he joins us from time to time on the Locked On NFL Sunday Live live show david how you doing my man i'm doing good always good to talk to you cody uh good to talk to you uh, sire is that how you say your first name for the sire but i like sire. Yeah, that's for the a first good one that sounds yeah, like royal you know like a royalty type <laughs> there you go and it's and i feel bad because actually i've watched episodes of locked on i'm a subscriber on my personal my own personal youtube profile i don't have a channel i don't do anything there uh but i'm a subscriber i watch what you guys do you've been a good addition to the show i mean Thank adding you. to cody rourke is is hard to do and i think you've done a good job Oh, you guys, you guys Sarah really makes me look really great. Sarah, Sarah is the <laughs> real superstar. He's the real rock star here of the show here, Lockdown Broncos. I love Sarah. Sarah is the goat. I owe a lot of my career to Sarah, honestly. Uh, yeah, we'll, nice. t- we'll tell that story another day. But, uh, David, look, a, a matchup on Sunday between these two teams, and I think each team has a variety of different questions. You look at the Broncos side of things. They've had their struggles dropping four straight games. You look at Washington. The defense hasn't been, I think, what most people had expected coming into the season. Uh, you know, first off, I just want to ask you about the offense offense here obviously no Ryan Fitzpatrick he's been dealing with that uh, that hip subluxation he's still on crutches we found out last week that's yeah. five to six weeks on crutches that's painful uh, he's mm-hmm. going to get a good upper body workout but Taylor Heineke has stepped into the mold for him and I think Taylor Heineke based on what I've seen I think he's done a pretty good job he has his moments but overall what have been your thoughts on the first half of the season so far for this Washington football team yeah I mean the biggest story really as much as you want it to be about the quarterback situation and the quarterback's always going to be super important it's the defense. It's it's the subpar performance by the defense. You know, this is a unit that was expected to be by some a top five defense in the NFL, at least a top half of the league uh, type of defense for a consistent stretch of the year. You know, they they ended last year on a really good note, and that was kind of what sparked a little bit uh, of the hype and the excitement. And even within the organization, Ron Rivera uh, touched on how much they expected out of the unit. Jack Del Rio did as well. Not trading up to draft for a guy like Trey Lance, Justin Fields, because you feel like you have a defense right now that can help carry you back into the playoffs. And you don't want to reset things while you feel like you have a little bit of a window opening. So there were a lot of expectations around this unit. And I don't think they necessarily succumbed to the pressure. And that's why they struggled coming out the gates. I think they just weren't there yet. And I think what what happened, and a lot of people pointed this out already, is that last year's schedule was a lot easier than this year's schedule. I mean, you look at who they've already, we're not even halfway through the season. They've already had Aaron Rodgers. They've already had Patrick Mahomes. They've already had Justin Herbert, Josh Allen. And they've got Tom Brady coming up and Teddy Bridgewater you already know, Cody, I'm a, I'm a huge Teddy B guy. He's not he's no slouch on his own. Not as dynamic, granted, as some of the quarterbacks they've already seen, and maybe that's going uh, to play into their, their benefit this weekend. But they've faced a murderer's row of quarterbacks already, and then right out of their bye, they get Super Bowl champion Tom Brady. Most people say, you know, we should have an advantage coming out of our bye. Well, you got the Super Bowl champs coming into your house after the, after the bye week, so good luck with that. I mean, it's, it's so – it's to be expected a little bit. I think once people kind of took a step back and realized what they were really up against – I think you kind of expected a little bit and chase young's lack of ability. I'll say right now to get consistent production uh, out of the defensive end position. There is really, I think was kind of sparked it because as the defense was expected to be so good, he was expected for, for however fair it might be for a second year player. Uh, he was expected to kind of take that next step into like the Joey Bosa uh, type of category of defensive ends. And it just hasn't happened. Well, I'd say on both sides for this matchup, Broncos and Washington alike, some maybe unmet expectations early on or in almost the first half now of the season. It's crazy how quickly it's gone by. The Broncos have almost been sort of a get-right team in recent weeks for for the teams that they're facing. So, unfortunately, yeah. I hate to say it like that, but <laughs> I, I'm interested to know from your perspective, what do you what do you see as you scout this Broncos team? What do you see some areas where you feel like Washington might be able to get right this week. Yeah, no, I laugh because Washington has also been a get right team. And so far they've had several matchups like Josh Allen was kind of struggling to open the season when he played Washington. 
So it was like, okay, is Washington's defense going to get right against a struggling quarterback, or is the quarterback going to get right? Well, it turns out it's the quarterback that's going to that's going to get right. <laughs> New Orleans Saints, Jameis Winston, they had just come off that disappointing loss at home to the Giants. All right, are the Saints going to continue to flounder a little bit and struggle, or are they going to get right, or is the Washington defense going to get right? Well, it turns out Jameis Winston and the Saints offense is going to get right. So it's just that's how it's been, I think, for both sides. Like you said, there's a lot of similarities between both these squads, unfortunately, uh, because two talented rosters. But when I look at the Denver Broncos, uh, I kind of look at the running game, right? So you, you look at Dearness Johnson, not the same type of running back that they have in Washington, which is against my own advisement as much as you know anybody in the Washington football team organization is going to listen to what I have to say. Uh, they got rid of their only bowling ball running back in Peyton Barber. He was the only guy that really brought any type of thump to him. And Dearness Johnson, I think he took everybody by surprise. I mean, I picked the Broncos. Mm-hmm. Cody, you know this. I picked the Broncos to win that game because I'm like, no Nick yeah. Chubb, no Kareem Hunt, uh, no, no Baker Mayfield, even though I'm not the biggest Baker Mayfield fan. I'm like – they're going to have no offense. Well, it turns out Dernis Johnson brought a lot of smoke uh, to that game. So kudos to him for doing it. But, you know, the Washington football team doesn't have a guy like that. Like they have a shifty guy, Antonio Gibson, J.D. McKissick, a little bit more of a straight line runner. But they don't have a guy that can really thump at the at the at the point of attack at the mesh pointer or, or, you know, at the line of scrimmage if he, or even behind the line of scrimmage if they need to. So my concern is, if, can they make a guy miss? I think there's opportunities there. There's a couple lanes. I know the broadcast team even mentioned, like I could have run through that lane. It was Troy Aikman. Talking about he could have run through the lane that was that was cleared out. Washington's offensive line has been a surprisingly good point yeah. for this for this team, even though they dealt with some injuries as well. Um, they were kind of expected to be one of the weaker spots. They've actually been really good. So if they can create some lanes in that Broncos defense, uh, especially depending on what's going on with Von Miller, then there are some opportunities there. I think for Antonio Gibson and for J.D. McKissick, especially as Antonio Gibson continues to deal with the shin injury, to get some to get some lanes. And I'll be honest with you guys. If Washington takes a page out of Cleveland's book, Cleveland has some downfield threats, but not a lot of of speed comparatively to a lot of teams in the NFL. I think Washington's kind of in the same boat. If they can get the Denver secondary to back off as much as they did against Cleveland, Taylor Heineke is going to run for 150 yards uh, in this game. That's going to be big. I think that if I'm Scott Turner, I'm trying to push that Broncos defense out as much as I possibly can and tell my quarterback, look, dude, first read, second read, your third read is running. Make sure you make sure you look at it that way. That's what we saw against the Green Bay Packers, and it led up to a game where they could have possibly competed uh, to pull off that upset, some other reasons why they didn't do that. But that's kind of the biggest thing that stands out to me. It's almost like playing the Packers really gave Washington a good, I don't want to say warm-up, you know, because that sounds like I'm diminishing the Denver Broncos, but that's not really – it's just – it's a very similar type of game plan, I think, that's going to be effective against the Broncos if they decide to use it. Now, we'll have to take a look at how that's going to go because there's obviously a lot of things the Broncos have to fix on the rushing defense here. Last question I'm going to ask you on the Washington football team side of things here, David. Uh, you know, looking at wide receiver, you know, banged up. Curtis Samuel, key offseason acquisition. The groin injury has simply just limited him. He's not been able to go. He tried to come back. He re-aggravated it. Diami Brown also, I think, was dealing with the knee injury. You have Terry McLaurin. And then, to my understanding still, is Logan Thomas still on injured reserve at this point as we're talking? And if not, I mean, do they expect to elevate him soon? Yeah, as, as we're talking right now, uh, Logan Thomas has not been activated. He's missed enough games that I believe he can be activated. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we don't have the official quote-unquote, uh, but John Keim um, of ESPN does does a really great job of covering the Washington football team. He he actually already broke it down. Deami Brown uh, didn't practice. Terry McLaurin also didn't practice. Curtis Samuel, uh, like you said, he's just – it's. I mean, it's injury, so you don't want to blame the guy, but it's it's he's been a, disapp- a huge disappointment. Uh, and then those offensive linemen also, Sam Cosby, Wes Schweitzer, and also – uh, not practicing. Brandon Scherf did practice. Um, so that's that's a little bit encouraging that they might be able to get their all pro guard back uh, for this game. But Cam Sims, the other wide receiver, uh, was limited in practice. He had a hamstring. He missed last weekend. It's a hamstring. So you guys know how those go. Um, but yeah, a lot of injuries with the wide receivers. Hey, well, you know, it's obviously tough to overcome injuries. The Broncos know it. The Washington football team knows it. The whole NFL right now, for some reason, soft tissue injuries are the issue all across the league. But ladies and gentlemen, coming up here in just a moment, we're going to get into a further discussion. Dave is going to ask Sarah and myself questions related to the Denver Broncos and Sunday's matchup. Before we do that, let me tell you about the sponsor. Today's episode of the show, it's our good friends over there, BetOnline.ag. Week 8 of NFL action is here, and BetOnline is your number one source for all things pro basketball, pro football, college football, NHL, MLB. They they got everything for you at betonline.ag with a new updated site and user interface that makes it easier for you, the consumer, to find the latest odds, 
props, and all the brand new contests today. And if you can go to the website right now on your computer or your mobile device, make sure you sign up and use promo code LOCKDOWN to get yourself a 50% welcome deposit bonus today. Once again, promo code LOCKDOWN will get you a 50% welcome deposit bonus here today. From your favorite Vegas casino games to the NFL games, all the action, as we mentioned, and even UFC and MMA action, BetOnline is your go-to for everything that you need. BetOnline, where the game begins. All right, guys, continuing this crossover Thursday episode, Washington football team getting set to visit the Mile High City and the Denver Broncos. My my home state, Cody, you know, I'm yes. I'm always I'm always going to call consider myself a Colorado win for I mean, I'm probably never going to live there again, to be quite honest with you. But I'm Colorado is always going to hold a special place in my heart. So this was a game I was actually hoping to make the trip uh, to be able to cover. But for other extenuating circumstances, that's not going to come to fruition this year. But any chance I get to go to Denver is going to be one that I take. And honestly. This is probably this is this is watch football team fans only chance in the next three weeks as far as we see it for them to have a little bit of, of hoping and grab onto a thread of, of happiness as they take on the Denver Broncos by week coming up. So I guess you can be happy they're not going to lose. Right. Because you can't lose in the bye week. Uh, it's like getting fired on your day off. But then the Super Bowl champions, like I mentioned already coming in the week after that. When I look at this matchup, I think at the beginning of the season, I wouldn't have expected to say that I think this is a game that the watch football team could act, actually win. Um, I don't know what the betonline.ag lines are right now. I'm sure we'll continue to track those as we get later into the season. But I'm confident this is a team that can compete and and hang in this game. They they were able to hang in for the most part against the Green Bay Packers. Here's how I think they're going to be able to, to do that, guys. And I look at Teddy Bridgewater in the offense. This is the question I have for you. I know what the broadcast team said, but we know the national pundits don't always have the best view of the team that you guys do. And you guys do a great job along with some other Denver media uh, they do a great job. Some not so much, Cody. I saw you tweeting about that a little bit uh, over over recent days, and I agree with you completely. Are they not trusting Teddy Bridgewater to push the ball down the field, or is there another reason? Is it just defense is taking away the deep ball on why they continue to go short? I mean, the Denver Broncos have one of the lowest third down conversion ratings in the National Football League, and when I saw that number, I went back to kind of looking like, why is it? And it just honestly looks like it doesn't matter if it's third and four, they throw it two yards. If it's third and nine, they throw it six yards. Instead of throwing six yards on third and four, you know, so it's it just kind of seems weird to me. And it looks to me like a unit that doesn't trust their quarterback. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. We had Tim Jenkins on, and Tim does a great job doing film breakdowns on the quarterback position and taking a look at it, too. And he said one of the biggest things he believes is that the Broncos script coming into games, the first 10 plays, it sucks. And, and it's the same thing. So teams are really kind of catching on to what the Broncos' tendencies are. And so for Teddy Bridgewater, I don't necessarily think it's the his inability to push the ball downfield because he's taken several shots downfield this season, and he's done it with ease. But several of the shots downfield he's taken, he's overthrown guys as well. And sometimes he's He's underthrown. So he's not a consistent deep ball guy. And, and to your point, too, third and six, you're going to throw four yards. What's happening is that you're seeing, and this is what Tim Jenkins told us in yesterday's episode, Lockdown Broncos. He says the guys that are going deep are open, but now he's resorting to throwing short. And he says, I'm not sure if that's a scheme thing or if it's the play call, but Teddy Bridgewater has also had a tendency to hold on to the football way too long. Mm -hmm. And Tim had said it best. He's holding on to the football while looking to go deep. And then he's throwing it short. So I think there's an issue in terms of maybe pulling the trigger a little bit. And that has been a little bit of a hindrance in the Broncos offense. And to be honest with you, David, I don't believe that can be sustainable. Not to mention against those Washington football team that even though that Chase Young only has, I believe, one and a half sacks on the season, you can't discount that, especially in a game like this, because this is the opportunity for he, Montez Sweat, and the defensive interior to really create pressure. And Teddy Bridgewater's had a tendency to step up into the pocket, into his own lineman, and I think it's a footwork, it's a technique thing, as Tim has alluded to. So it depends on what Broncos offense, which Teddy Bridgewater you're going to get this week. Yeah, and, and speaking of that Washington defense, they've done better the last three games. They've got six takeaways uh, total over the last three games, including three against Kansas City Chiefs uh, alone. Now, the offense hasn't been able to uh, put enough on the board. And you talk about Teddy Bridgewater being a little inaccurate when he throws downfield. Taylor Heineke is, has been criminally notorious here in the DMV for overthrowing receivers and for throwing too high on receivers. Guys like Terry McLaurin stretching out further than they probably ever have before in their entire lives, putting their entire midsection and everything else at risk to make these catches for their quarterback. What kind of a defensive approach do you think we're going to see from the Denver Broncos coming up against a quarterback in Taylor Heineke, who, again, he's he's inaccurate. He throws high, so you know maybe those safeties kind of stay back a little bit looking for some of those tip-pass pop uh, opportunities. But at the same time, though, Taylor Heineke is also more mobile than a lot of other quarterbacks in the NFL. And depending on which version you see, right, kind of a Jekyll and Hyde approach in this Washington offense, you go back to Kansas City, zero carries against Kansas City Chiefs for Taylor Heineke, scrambles or otherwise. 
But then you go uh, to last week, 95 rushing yards, the second most in franchise history for a Washington quarterback. So I believe you're going to get more of that Taylor Heineke than you are the Kansas City Chiefs zero carry Taylor Heineke. But what do you think Denver, what do you think Vic Fangio is expecting in this offense? Yeah, obviously Taylor Heineke, not a rookie quarterback, but I think Vic Fangio might approach it similar to what he does when he's facing off against rookie quarterbacks, use a lot of four and five man pressures. The Broncos do have the, you know, they do have a young couple of inside linebackers right now, actually just traded for Kenny Young from the Los Angeles Rams, yeah. who is expected to start this week, according to one of the one of the guys who covers the Broncos for nine news Denver. So he's expected to play a significant role. So what I talked about on previous episodes as these linebackers are dropping like flies in Denver is to simplify things for those guys by having them blitz a little bit more often. Just give him a gap and tell him to go. So I think that we're going to see a bit a bit of aggressiveness from Fangio, but at the same time, he really likes to make quarterbacks think back there in the pocket. So with a guy like Heineke who's capable of, of running, you want to make him win from the pocket, and you want to make him throw against your coverage. And, of course, teams have had plenty of success throwing deep on the Broncos this year, if not all throughout the game, at least a few times per game. And game-changing plays – deep downfield, which is where I think, like you mentioned, if he's overthrowing passes, this could be an opportunity where the Broncos, you know, like a, like a team like, like the New York Jets that they played earlier this season against Zach Wilson, you know, he, he kind of struggled with a little bit of his deep ball accuracy and the hands of his receivers, but those were opportunities the Broncos took advantage of with a couple of interceptions. And, and it's been a couple of weeks since we've seen the Broncos really take, take advantage of a quarterback in that way by creating turnovers. So I think we could see a little bit of that, a little bit less, you know, blue a little bit less, you know, six man pressure or seven or whatever that is. And having Vic Fangio and his scheme really forced Taylor Heineke to throw it into max coverage. Yeah. Unless you talk about those linebackers too. I mean, Antonio Gibson, unfortunately has put the ball on the ground way more than, than you want out of a starting running back, especially one with the uh, ceiling that we, we think that Antonio Gibson has, you know, see if he continues to climb that ladder as well. And guys, when I look at this matchup, I look at two defensive focused teams, right? Vic Fangio, Ron Rivera, consider two of the better defensive minds, in the NFL, but neither defense is really living up uh, to that height to that experience on the Washington side of things. It seems to be a little bit in the schemes. People are kind of questioning some of the play calling, maybe a little too much zone versus man coverage. What's going on on the Denver side? Is there just like a trend of defensive coaches that maybe, I mean, you look at Todd Bowles, right? Goes to New York jets really struggles as a head coach there. Some of that's probably organizational as well. Not just on Todd Bowles. Then he goes to Tampa and now he's, you know, the, the best defense coordinator in the NFL. A lot of people would say, a prime candidate to be a head coach this next off season. Do you think it's just defensive coaches need to say coordinators or do you think there's something more to this and what's going on on the Denver side of things? I say it's a little bit of both, right? You want to factor in player execution. Obviously, if they get a call, you have to run the coverage. You have to execute. But also, it's on the coaching side of things, too, because the defensive backfield has been put into situations that I don't think are very opportune for them to make plays. And when they've been giving up these big plays, a lot of it is the pass rush. The pressure hasn't gone home against the Baltimore Ravens. You know what they ran? They ran cover zero, and they couldn't keep con I mean they were told to keep containing the edge rushers but not to pressure Lamar Jackson from the outside because if you cut down too far inside he's going to run to the outside you're mm -hmm. not going to have any help so a lot of time for Lamar Jackson for guys like Ben Roethlisberger who was having a really bad season coming into that matchup just a lot of time for those guys to throw and Derek Carr as we know can pick apart defenses left and right don't matter if you're playing man coverage or zone coverage he knows where to go there and so the pass rush for the Broncos simply has not been getting home no pressure on the defensive interior has forced guys to scramble outside and then the pass rushers haven't stepped up von miller is dealing with a lot of attention or has dealt with it and then the other guy opposite of him malik reed who we're very high and we love malik reed he just simply hasn't been getting home and i think that's been a a pain point here for the broncos in the secondary and unfortunately it's led to a lot of these big plays and i know this is going to be a big weekend because it's ronald darby's uh game against his former team that's very true final question for me guys i'm a big javante williams fan i'm a, I'm, a I'm a huge draft guy totally. like, <laughs> not like the draft network type of guy like i could never go work for the draft network i don't, I don't i'm not that into the draft but i love january to april is one of my favorite times of football i love going down to mobile and seeing those guys i was huge on javante wanted washington to draft javante williams hell i wanted tampa to, to draft Javante. i just wanted somebody that i covered to draft javante williams <laughs> instead he goes to denver which very happy for all my my, my people back in colorado who are who are still broncos fans always Keep an eye on those guys pulling for you there. Are we going to see more Javante Williams? Because I liked what I saw Thursday night. I heard the broadcast mention fans have been wanting to see more Javante Williams, and we know how this works. If the fans have been wanting to see him too, you can bet the media have been wanting to see him too. So you guys, I'm sure we're, a little, we're very happy about what you saw from Javante, uh, unless I'm just looking at the Rose College classes, just wanting Javante to be next coming of the great running back in the NFL. Do you think we're going to see more of that, or, or how do you think that that's going to play out this weekend with him 
and uh, Melvin Gordon. Well, obviously he got the got the touchdown against Cleveland last week on the screen pass, which was like even in a loss, just looking up to the sky at the football gods and just yeah. thanking, you know, my my gosh, it's been all season. We've been waiting to see screen plays to the running backs, especially Javante, who we know, man, he can run over anybody yeah. in the open field. Just ask Marlon Humphrey, who was dragged for 20 yards. But <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's more Javante this week, man. Definitely. I mean, he had four carries against the Cleveland Browns, which is an absolute atrocity, a, cr- yeah. a criminal offense by Pat Shermer to only give Javante Williams four carries in a game. And between he and Melvin Gordon combined, they only had 12 carries total in that game. So a lack of commitment to the running game by the Denver Broncos has been a consistent talking point for us. And I know for Cody and I throughout the season, but specifically when a guy like Javante is only getting four carries, it's got nowhere to go but up, right? So I, I really hope that's the case this week against Washington. But of course, that defensive front, it, it's its frightening. You know I mean? Sure, Regardless of how well they've played, we talk about get-right games. You know, Chase Young, you never know when he's going to go all Max Crosby from two weeks ago and have three and a half, four and a half sacks in a game. The Broncos have been known to surrender such games. So if guys are getting penetration like that throughout this game, it's going to be tough for Javante. But, man, the Broncos really do need to kind of force feed him. Look at Derrick Henry last week. I think he had, like, what, 26 carries for 80-some yards or something, something like that. They just kind of force feed their best player right now it's tough to say Javante has not been one of the Broncos biggest sources of big plays offensively so definitely hope to see more of him this week and hopefully he can get to the second level a few times and we'll see what he can do when he gets in the open field he's always a candidate for those angry runs so definitely need to see more Javante <laughs> well ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode crossover Thursday across the Locked On Podcast Network Locked On Broncos joined alongside by Locked On Washington football team a fun game slated for Sunday Peyton Manning being honored at halftime for the Ring of Fame but you know it goes the Halloween theme you have Chase Young I can already see the Fox broadcast I can already see the mask, the Jason mask, the Freddy mask, wherever you want to have between he and Jerry, Judy, and David, as Sarah likes to say, one, two, Jerry's coming for you.